Can you all hear me? Can you all see me? Well, this was the one we used to in the pro-COVID times, the virtual calls, right? Thank you. Um, look, I think um, it was a great couple of sessions. Um, one thing that was common uh, that we all learned is about data was the common thing that we all learned. Um, how much of the importance that was there, um, including from the opening um, session from Arvind and then Pankaj and everything. I think I want to welcome um, all the fellow panelists here, uh, Mr. Animesh, Ravi, and Nagraj. Thank you for being with me. Um, I think one of the, um, the, the topic for today is uh, using data at the forefront of marketing strategy. Um, I think um, coming back to our topic, um, while technology plays a really bigger low, bigger uh, play in developing a successful marketing strategy, but with always on smartphones and computers and connected devices and the data it generates for marketeers, the challenges have never been greater. Okay? And, and for a marketeer, um, every uh, conversation starts and ends with data. Okay? I think to deal with a lot of uh, uncertainty, complexity, and the change, uh, we generally normally lean into right technology, um, the right people, and the right process. I think we learned that in the last um, session also. Um, but there is actually always a bigger elephant in the room is the robust data strategy. Right? I think the first thing that I wanted to really understand for my fellow panelists here to how big is or important role a robust data strategy is in some of the decision making that you do. Uh, hi, good morning everybody. Uh, this is Animesh, I'm from ITC. Uh, spent a lot of time in actually sales and distribution and then moved on to technology and analytics. So a lot of what I'll share with you is uh, based on my experiences in how sales and uh, distribution happens in FMCG. I represent ITC Limited and as you all know we are a large FMCG organization with huge reach across the country. A lot of our investments actually went into uh, making sure we get the right granular data which meant a lot of investments that we did in terms of uh, our, you know, systems and processes at our distributors, at our frontline sales team. Uh, the entire focus of our investments was making sure that we get the right granular data at the required frequency. Uh, we have large number of uh, field force which visits the markets on a, on a daily basis. Close to 40,000 uh, frontline salesmen who are there in the market. So ITC as an organization has invested heavily in uh, enabling them through digital tools. Each one of our frontline salesperson has got a personalized app uh, on a mobile smartphone which collects all the information that's required by us and on a real-time basis we have access to what's happening in the market in terms of sales. Uh, that being our primary uh, system as far as the data collection is concerned. Over a period of time, we have also invested heavily on consumer data, which meant uh, information collected across social media, across our brand activations that we do, uh, across uh, you know, third-party data that also we engage with. We have also, over the last five years, invested in D2C, because we realized that it's important to get uh, you know, first-party information uh, with a, with a platform, so we, we have created ITC eStore, which is operating in uh, many of the metros and large towns, which serves as a primary information as far as the trends and consumer uh, behavior is concerned. So all of that put together, our strategy has been to integrate all the data, and we've invested in cloud technology. We are putting together all our data, harmonizing them, making sure that they're ready for any analytics. And of course, that investment has taken us at least three to four years because that's where you make sure that you have the right quality of data and all analytics then becomes possible on top of it. That's been our journey and, and our strategy is you know, constantly to make sure the quality of information, the frequency at which it is expected, they're all of highest order. 
Go ahead, Ravi. So, uh, if I you see, uh, uh, just uh, one line on my background is uh, I come from the consumer tech world, uh, Flipkart, and before that, it spent about a decade in Silicon Valley and consumer tech as well. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, I think. Uh, See, we are what you would call uh, a digital native, uh, it's a term that's used. So, for us, uh, uh, if I look at it, uh, uh, I'll talk not just about as a marketeer, but from a consumer company, consumer tech company, right? See, for us, literally every decision, everything, the whole business is run primarily with data. There is no other way to even run our business, even consumer preferences. What we understand about our consumer, we have around uh, 500 million, uh, which is about a third of India's population is our uh, sort of the user base. So you have a very good section of the entire India and uh, in that almost all consumer preference are revealed. So we do use the external uh, market research kind of approaches, but more to understand at very high level because uh, really consumer revelation of com consumer preference happens in the platform itself. And uh, so if I look at it, almost everything we understand is through data, uh, more or less, right? It's uh, whether what sort of assortment we carry, what sort of uh, 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 sellers we bring on the platform, what sort of products we bring on the platform. All of these, uh, for example, are re revealed by our consumers through search, through browse, to filters they use, so on and so forth. So fundamentally, I would say end-to-end -end our entire value chain, right? Looking at uh, which consumer to, I mean, so what do consumers want, what selection to bring on board, what sellers to bring on board, what sort of uh, uh, quality requirements are there, what is the speed of delivery that's required, or pretty much everything is revealed through data. For example, delivery speed, you would look at which uh, product requires higher delivery speed, which requires lower delivery speed, you can look at uh, your promise and the conversion on your platform and you can say what those are votes that consumers are giving. So these are absolutely revealed preferences, which means that you actually understand what the consumer is trying to tell you. Hi, I'm uh, Nagraj. I'm from Madison World, so I'll be talking from an advertising agency and a marketing sort of a, uh, view. So actually for us, Everything is about consumer journey and we primarily use the uh, data to define the consumer journey and also to understand the consumer journey. And by consumer journey, what we mean is it starts anywhere from the uh, how the consumer views your brand's perception to the final purchase. And along the way, you know, what are the touch points that he gets influenced and um, how best we can influence. That's how we uh, use data and we work as an agency, we don't uh, own our own data. We work with marketers like uh, ITC and Flipkart. And what we have seen is actually they represent the two extreme ends. So companies like uh, Flipkart are Absolutely. very data heavy and they are, uh, you know, the challenges are different. And uh, companies like ITC who are in FMCG, while they are huge spenders in advertising their data in terms of, you know, first party data, mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a challenge, so the way we handle that is very different. But the common problem that we, and as in the marketing fraternity, we try to do is how much, uh, I'll, I'll put it in three buckets. The first bucket is how much incremental sale or in incremental revenue I can get because I have access to high quality data. The second is optimization, how much can I do more for less or you know do more for the same. And third, which is the most interesting, and that's where I think uh, most of the marketers should focus, which is how, do, how well do I get the product market fit? Because if you get product market fit, and I don't think in the past we ever had such a rich data, you know, uh, we used to go and do market research, that uh, most of the time I had just done one uh, experiment where, you know, an ad which was never shown on TV, when we went and asked them, where did you last see? 60% like, uh, of them said they saw on TV and we know that ad was never aired on TV. So, you know, when you do a market research, especially without measuring their behavior, it's not good. Today, we get very high quality customer behavior data, you know, either it is through search volumes as a simple as one or through purchases as, you know, final leg. And that has helped marketers understand market fit, market product fit better and uh, you know as the saying goes if you are a dog food manufacturer and if the dog loves the food you don't you don't have anything else to worry 
So the same way, you know, whatever, if, they, if you can get the product to the consumer and using data, uh, we are able to do that. At least we are able to give those insights which help marketers get there. That's a great point. I think uh, the, the beauty of this combination that we have here is, one is ep extremely complexity. Anime spoke about in terms of the offline reliance and then the, and then the group level. And then Ravi spoke about really good, um, this, no matter how much uh, the, the user base is, the speed of which that you want to use that data is an important. And of course, Nagra summed it up by uh, really um, saying that how, how consultative approach that you need to take really by working with both the worlds, right? It's a good point. Um, like, while we understand this uh, data strategy, I think um, one of the biggest, we've been hearing this over a many number of years, the, uh, the different data types that's available, and um, how, um, how is this, the, after the cookie-less world, how important it is and respectful it is to own, um, respect our own data versus really relying on an acquired or you know, source data. That comes to our des next uh, you know, um, really um, important thing that I wanted to cover up is around the first party data strategy, right? So be it offline and online. Really wanted to understand um, how important it is, how are you embracing that for yourself in your respective businesses? Maybe I can start. Uh, uh, as, a, as a traditional FMCG company, it's very difficult to get FMCG uh, first party data because a lot of your sales, especially in uh, categories that we operate in, happens through the uh, offline stores. And that's a known challenge and therefore uh, a lot has been done over a period of time to actually complement uh, information uh, with the information available from uh, offline sources. Uh, what therefore we have been doing is to rely on uh, consumer touch points, which are also opportunities for collection of first party data. So things like building on activation data, we do a lot of activations in the offline stores. And those become our first source of information about consumers. So that, that's something that we have been compiling over a period of time. So the activation becomes the first source. Uh, in case of ITC, fortunately, we also have a, a business in hotels. And that is a very, very great source of consumer data. So what we have been doing is to think across different businesses within ITC, how can we leverage that information for FMCG businesses? And therefore, there is a thought which is being worked upon to look at any business of ITC collects information about consumers. It is an asset, you know, which can be leveraged across different businesses of ITC. So we are creating a data lake which comprises information captured from different businesses of ITC. And that being used as, as an asset across the organization. Uh, recently, as I had also mentioned earlier, that we started with ITC eStore. And uh, while it doesn't give you a whole volume of information, but what it definitely tells us is about trends, preferences, patterns, uh, consumer behavior in certain geographies, and these are also lead indicators for us. So that's the way, given our context of FMCG operations, that's the way we are dealing with uh, the first party uh, data. Thanks. See, uh, uh, in uh, Flipkart, uh, I think uh, you mentioned it, Santosh. Uh, first party data is not the problem. What is the problem, which is a big challenge, uh, is how to act on it in near real time. So you're talking about petabytes of data acting on it near real time, right? So you have things like uh, n is equal to one kind of uh, marketing where you're essentially doing personalized recommendations based on what you bought last week, last month, so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you're also doing cohort level personalization. Uh, it could be geo-based, gender-based, it could be affluence-based, so on and so forth. All of these have to come together at the point when you are on the app browsing. So that is one big challenge. The other thing maybe I'll spend a little bit time on is where is the world going? Okay, so if with the world today, right, we have invested heavily in uh, uh, applications of generative AI, for example, right? So if you look at things, there are uh, approaches by which, for example, based on uh, your brow means the entire consumer's base browse history. Today, our fashion design happens on a 
computer. Somebody in my team actually builds designs for kurtis, for saris, and uh, so on and so forth uh, through an approach called stable diffusion, a generative AI approach, by which uh, you are actually building designs that are going to sell well based on uh, millions and millions of search, browse, purchase, uh, data history. It's a, a generative AI technology which uh, uh, is used. Again, similarly, large language models uh, can be built to understand much more. See, search itself will evolve pretty soon. See, search has been a big source of understanding consumer based on what they reveal as what they need. But even that will get disrupted in the next five uh, years or so with generative AI, with large language models, where uh, you can have much more conversational way of looking at things in retail. And as that comes on board into e-commerce, uh, this is something we are building. I'm sure other e-commerce companies would be building something as well. And uh, what uh, happens with that is, uh, uh, with that, you will start sort of building very, very targeted way of understanding what the consumers want. The revealed preference, see, historically marketing used to be understanding means questionnaires, surveys, things like that, where it's very, very difficult. Means obviously there are approaches to get revealed preferences. Uh, I think revealed preference, getting revealed preference has become easier and easier with these kind of uh, e-commerce and uh, things like that, where consumers are there searching. For example, uh, nobody knows about the world more than uh, a search engine or an e-commerce platform on what consume. E-commerce platform more from a product perspective, search engine more from all kinds of intents perspective and so on. First bit, uh, party data, you know, from an advertising community, is the buzzword for the last four years because every year the cookie was supposed to die and uh, it has taken four years and still in the ICU but it has not died because I think Google has to, uh, you know, to take out the ventilator. Whatever, I mean, jokes apart, we are, the last four years most of the marketers have understood the importance of uh, first party data and they know whatever personalization, which have given uh, tremendous uh, results. When you personalize an ad and or a communication, it gives obviously a very high ROI. So the advertisers understand the importance of first party data. Again, comparing the two panelists, what we also see is in the FMCG, CPG sort of a business, the richness of first party data is really little difficult in the sense, you know, there what happens is how do I connect uh, many data sources, how do I do a fusion so that, you know, from a small data I get a larger data pool to, so, you know, there the discussions are more on enrichment and enrichment is a big uh, a problem because, you know, we have two big guys, especially in, from the advertising world, the Meta and the Google who contributes nearly 70% of uh, digital business and they don't share their data, they don't talk to each other. So, ma award marketers are now talking about uh, you know, how do we do data control, I mean, data clean rooms, DCRs, and enrich the first party uh, data, whatever little they have, they want to do it. The second seg uh, segment where they get good data is the retail business, whether, you know, it's the type, uh, let's say, a jewelry retailer or, you know, uh, fast food chains. They get very rich data, and they may not be as rich as, let's say, the third data set, which is pure uh, uh, e-commerce player, either is a D D2C. But interestingly, what we see is all the three, the net has taken off quite well. So even a traditional FMCG business, there are a uh, lot of companies where online uh, contribution to their revenue is nearly 15 to 18 percent. So you are able to get the data and the more, the moment it crosses a certain amount of threshold, it starts mirroring the same behavior as you would see in the uh, retail segment. So I think if a brand gets 20, 25 percent of its business through online, whether it's through Amazon or Flipkart or whatever, then by and large the behavior becomes very similar to what happens in the retail world. If it's only 3 percent, then there's a huge difference, so you can't generalize. So that's one way we use the first party data. The retail business is actually all about, you know, it's very easy to enrich because you get the uh, first party data quite rich there. And uh, for uh, the final players like uh, Digital first business, obviously, they have too much of first party data in which they have to share it with uh, and help the lesser privilege of the two in terms of, you know, sharing their data in whatever, without, uh, you know, compromising the privacy, which is where the data clean rooms and all have uh, taken off. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Whether it's an offline world or online world, there's an ocean of data available. 
Um, that's where I think the data strategy and then the, the type of data strategy, right? When you get these two right, I think um, the biggest thing is now when you have a lot of data available, um, you start really um, doing something, building a strategy over it, um, running a lot of uh, think campaigns and things over it. Um, now it really comes to measuring things, right? That's where we actually get focused on. Um, so when I look at that, uh, generally, uh, in, in if I if I commonly hear the opens or clicks are really old time of measurements right now. So I'm really keen to understand, especially you know from from your perspective, Animesh. Um, but if, if I look at you know what Ravi spoke about, a ton of data, a lot of things are available, and I'm really uh, you know uh, curious to learn more in terms of the products are being developed based on the behaviors and etc. So what metrics do you normally use outside that to actually start measure? And then I want to hear from Ravi also how they've innovated beyond opens and clicks. Question is on uh, what metrics we use. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. absolutely. Uh, so a lot of analytics that we do as far as our sales uh, systems are concerned are towards increasing uh, you know, depth and range in the market. So very direct metrics which we talk about from a sales, uh, FMCG sales point of view is what's the incremental lines or the range that has been throughputted? What's the incremental sales that have been generated based on uh, the analytics which is running at the back end? Uh, more and more as we are developing analytical solutions for uh, our marketing mix. So we, we are already having solutions which are giving us uh, the right allocation between, uh, so it's the typical market mix modeling work, you know, that's going on right now. So there, of course, you're able to measure through these models, what is the ROI of, of your investments. So if you spent a rupee on uh, consumer promotions, what's the incremental sales you generated? So metrics like those which are standard metrics of ROI. Uh, of course, we also track very closely the, uh, the brand health measures, like the mind measures, uh, you know, recall, spont, and you're able to now, with the help of these modeling techniques, able to isolate the impact of these individual investments, whether it is in media or it is in consumer promotions or it's in trade promotions, what is each of them attributing to your overall sales? So a lot of these are very standard but direct impact on sales and we really are very focused on our you know, revenue and cost parameters. Every, each of these operating metrics will translate into some sort of a financial outcome and that's, that's what we finally measure at the end of it. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think there, I think it's a lot of things are common because I think eventually, finally the outcome is the outcome. It doesn't matter whether you're offline, online, what you are, right? Uh, so key things are if you look at uh, short term, it is uh, at a session level or a session level. See, the most granular is session level conversion, session level uh, revenues and so on. Then maybe next level is the cross session. So for example, if you're buying a TV, you don't come one time and buy it. You keep coming a few times and uh, uh, buy it. So what happens cross session? Then what happens in uh, every month, M1, we call it M1 repeat, how often do you repeat? Then going to we have a RFMD framework, recency, frequency, monetary value and diversity. Diversity here means we are a horizontal platform. Our success is defined by people buying uh, uh, clothes from us, uh, diapers from us, TVs from us, mobiles from us, so on and so forth. So diversity is very important. And, uh, the, and obviously the CLTV, uh, customer lifetime value, right? Uh, and these are our objectives, much like any FMCG, any retailer, right? they are very similar metrics. Where I think we can bring in some level of differentiation is around uh, being able to pull all the data together and become very predictive about what drives these metrics and how do you be very deliberate about moving some of these metrics and uh, this is where some of the new technologies have uh, become very, very useful in particularly machine learning, AI and so on. See, as uh, you know, I used to work in a, an analytics specialist uh, companies before. So as a service, uh, what I have observed is most marketers, they can use data 
either to get incremental sales. By that, what I mean is if, that, if not for that data, that sales would not have happened or, you know, that revenue stream would not have been opened up. For example, uh, take ITC also. If not for e-commerce, certain of their revenue, that's an incremental to what they were doing and probably. Then the second is optimization where, you know, because of uh, availability of richer data, how do I optimize? So he was saying about market mix. So previously, market mix used to be, you know, a little bit of science and art because uh, of the lack of data. So there used to be a lot of leapfrogs. We used to have some benchmarks, and therefore we used to come and say, this is how you need to allocate. Today, it is becoming more of uh, science, which is what it should be because we have a very uh, richer data sets and we will be able to quantify it that much better and also uh, using uh, very robust machine learning algorithms, even prediction to a large extent, especially if you have a very uh, sound data, let's say in a retail or in an e-commerce platform, we are able to predict it with fair amount of accuracy. So if you change your mix from, uh, let's say, high on TV to high on digital, this is what you would get. And by and large, those models hold good when we do that uh, uh, thing. So, two metrics that most marketers need to adopt is what is the incremental uh, sales or incremental revenue, which are genuinely incremental. That is, outside of not using the data, I would not have got that. And how well I optimize. I think those are the broad two families of uh, metrics that most marketers should uh, are adopting. Okay. No, I think um, the good learning out of this is, I think um, Ravi said that, is whether it's actually offline or online, pretty much metrics remain the same, right? So whether it's, it's actually um, going to be ROI, like Animesh mentioned, everywhere, or it could be across different behaviors and everything. It's a, it's, it's a good point. I think uh, let's, let's wrap it up with just one piece of advice in terms of... Um, really looking at, now we have the data strategy right, now we know what data target, how do we measure. Um, just the last one, last advice, and um, what do you advise, um, you know, uh, it could, or other um, CDOs or CMOs in terms of uh, a differentiative factor that you can bring in, whether in terms of a technology or a unification, anything at all. Um, any advice here are for the, I don't know the differentiation that you want to bring in. Uh, uh, just a quick one line since we are out of time is that I think uh, and we converged right if you look at uh, uh, sort of uh, whether it's ITC whether it's Flipkart the outcomes are the same so I think keep your focus on the outcomes technology data everything else is a means to an end and don't means you should get excited about new technology but not so excited that you forget what the outcome really is so that's the only thing I would say so I think my uh, observation is also when the marketer is very clear what should be the outcome or is very clear about what is the problem, then data can do real wonders. So marketers should spend a lot more time in identifying what is the problem they are trying to solve or what is the opportunity they are chasing. But they should be very being able to define the outcome in one line. I want so and so to happen. I mean, unless you are able to put it in one line, then there's not much you will get out of uh, data. So the big thing is to be very sharp and clear on the outcome that you're uh, expecting. I think just to add to these uh, perspectives, uh, in my experience, I think one important aspect for us to keep in mind is that while technology and data is quite well sorted, it's the change management and user adoption which typically gets missed out. and. Uh, you know, I, th I think there is a lot of investment that needs to go in that, those aspects. There are many ways to do it, right from engaging the actual stakeholders and end users at the early stage of the project itself. And then, you know, you know taking them along the entire journey of transformation, linking their KPIs to the outcomes that you expect, following up with a lot of communication. I think a whole lot of focus needs to go on change, ma change management and user adoption. So that's the only addition to the points being raised here. Thank you. Thanks again for today. And I'm, I'm sure the advice is well received. Outcome is pretty strong word. Then now, thank you.